tonight, uh, we really have a fantastic Hall of Fame series set up for you here. Uh, Jan Wenner is the man who revolutionized music journalism. In 1967, he founded Rolling Stone magazine, the first music magazine to take rock and roll seriously. Over the ensuing decades, Rolling Stone won many awards for its design, photography, public service, and journalism, and was instrumental in launching the careers of many groundbreaking journalists and photographers. In 1983, along with Ahmet Erdogan, Jan founded the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And over the last 27 years, we've welcomed over 13 million fans from all over the world to our doors here in Cleveland. Earlier this month, Jan's memoir, Like a Rolling Stone, was released to rave reviews. Following the event tonight, Jan will be signing copies outside of the theater. So please stick around after the interview to uh, go out there and purchase a copy of the book. They'll be available for sale, and Jan will be signing them, including personalizing it to you if you wish as well. Uh, I should also mention that uh, we will have a cash bar outside. So again, if you're going to hang around in the line to get it signed, you can grab a drink and enjoy talking to uh, your fellow rock and roll nerds who are in the audience here tonight. Thanks to all of you who submitted questions ahead of time, and uh, we will be working uh, to answer a bunch of those throughout the evening at the end of the interview as well. Interviewing Jan Winner tonight is Rock and Roll Hall of Fame President and CEO Greg Harris, who has known Jan for over a decade. <laughs> Greg has worked with Jan uh, and beyond to really take this museum to new heights. So it is really a special honor for me to be able to introduce Greg Harris and Jan Winner uh, for tonight's fantastic Hall of Fame series. So let's give a warm Rock and Roll Hall of Fame welcome to Greg Harris and Jan Winner. Thank you, Jan. You'll take the first seat, Jason. Thank you, Greg. All right. Done that before. <laughs> you could have been in for some big news break. <clears throat> yeah, isn't this great? This is fantastic. Yes. I'm delighted to be here. <laughs> I know a number of you for years, and this is great to catch up again. And thank you for buying that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, Jan's on tour. He was. Uh, you were on CBS Sunday Morning recently. Yeah. You were interviewed uh, by Bruce in we New did York. That in New York. That was the launch of the book, was appearing at a venue like this, 92nd Street Y, with Bruce being the interviewer. Yeah. And, and uh, I know that there was a great New York Times piece. And a lot of those folks have asked a lot of terrific questions. And the trick is here, we're in Cleveland tonight. We're in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. So we're going to ask a lot of those, but we're going to ask some slightly different questions because we're inside the place that you dedicated so much of your life to uh, and that you really put together. You know, Jason gave a wonderful intro, but I'm going to add a few things that burnish your Hall of Fame credibility. Thank How's you. that? Uh, let me just take a look here. I am not complaining so far. I like and, it. I like and, it. <laughs> and I do want to say we have a number of Rock and Roll Hall of Fame trustees in the house. And uh, so we need to really get our facts straight. Okay. They know their stuff. But trustees, in addition to the members we thank, to the donors we thank, to the friends and family trustees, uh, thank you for your support and your involvement with the museum. We're very grateful. But y Jason mentioned you were a co-founder of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. But I'd like to augment that um, Jan was also very instrumental in selecting Cleveland to have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. <laughs> And we can talk a little bit about that um, a little bit later, but I understand the Chicago mayor may have said something about Bruce Springtime. That's right. And that torpedoed them. Yeah. It, it is welcome to us. And in the mortal words of Bruce Springtime. <laughs> <laughs> just had to think, we're in the wrong place, my friend. So, so not only selecting Cleveland, but also um, selecting I Am Pay to do our building was here at the very opening at the very groundbreaking, turning a shovel over <laughs> with Yoko Ono, Amit Erdogan, Chuck Berry, Pete Townsend, Governor Voinovich, 
and, and others, a really magical Billy Joel. Day. Billy Joel as well. So uh, the groundbreaking, the opening, the opening concert. This is Cleveland. I'm, were you there? Chuck Berry, Bruce Springsteen, you know, a massive, massive show at the stadium next door that um, was probably the, the greatest thing in, in Cleveland rock and roll history, with all due respect to the Belkins, many shows here, and Jules is with us. But that thing was just nonstop uh, with artists. Um, in addition to these pieces, Jan produced and put together something called the 25th Anniversary Concerts for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Um, amazing shows at Madison Square Gardens with Stevie Wonder and um, Bruce Springsteen and U2 and Metallica and on and on and on and on. And he had an exhibit here at the museum that was about Rolling Stone magazine just a few years ago. Um, and what I didn't say is that he's also been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in 2004. So Jan, that's your... Your Hall of Fame credibility is, you know, impeccable. Um, with all of that, how does it feel? Today we walked around the museum. We went in the, um, the main exhibition hall, the Ahmet Erdogan Hall, and walked around. And then we went up to the Hall of Fame and looked at the Hall of Fame floor and looked at Jan's plaque. And then we watched the incredible um, Jonathan Demme uh, film in the Power of Rock Theater in which you... Um, connected us with Demi and encouraged us to go with him that he was the guy for this job. So as you see all of these things that you've touched, um, just like to get your sense for how it feel today. Well, it's, it's always wonderful to be here. I, it feels a little bit like a home. Um, I was particularly taken today with all the changes that have been made under Greg's leadership and the, the, the growth of the Hall of Fame. I'm both... both an explosion of more stuff going on that is consistent with the basic spirit, but just brought more rock and roll to it and more life to it and more fun to it. It's made it just a more, much more imaginative place than it ever had been. But, and I, you know, love going to this thing, look at that, oh, that was mine, oh, that one's mine, that one's mine. <laughs> but I think more than anything, today we are sitting aside watching John Mellencamp, where I was just looking up at the, the glass and then Gerda's for things, geez, and starting to think, I did that. And then you want to, or I was part of doing that, and, and you, I'd like to get more emotional about it. I start to get a little emotional, and I said, stop myself, fuck. It's just a building. What are you, you know? <laughs> it, it, it is a fantastic thing, a fantastic achievement. I feel like, I guess I may be being falsely modest about it, but, you know, I helped build this thing. You know, I helped make it. It came from nothing to this, from just an idea, you know, somewhere. I didn't realize till when I was writing a book, it occurred to me that without knowing it and starting the Hall of Fame then from its origins as a, somebody else's idea from somebody else years ago, and it wasn't even meant to be a building, it was meant to be a TV show. And uh, realizing that having done it all at this point, I'd, I'd done once again the same thing I had done with Rolling Stone, which was to set out to do the history of the music, celebrate it, honor its heroes, spread it around the world, telling everybody, you know, come on, jump in, have fun, enjoy it, you know? And it was the same thing. I feel I accomplished, it was a part of that same accomplishment, that same drive that I had in doing both of these things. Well, from um, turning the shovel out here to getting newsprint and adding words to it that um, then inspire people. That's the key, right? You you get to the where this music, how it connects all of us, uh, how it gives us a place to belong. Uh, and you hear about people reading Rolling Stone um, as teenagers somewhere in some other state or some other city, and it connects with them, and they feel like they belong, um, maybe not to the people around them, but to the other readers of this magazine. They can't wait to get off the college or get off some, to a band, to a live show, and see them and connect. Well, when we started in 1967, this kind of new kind of rock and drug culture, youth culture was just getting its, not even its roots yet, into various places in large cities or in college towns, you know, and, even, and they had to be large college towns like Cambridge, Massachusetts or LA or something like that. But if you were growing up in another town in the Midwest or Seattle or any number of places, this culture wasn't coming to you. There was no radio stations there and there was no rock and roll TV shows or movies, magazines didn't write about, newspapers. 
didn't write about it. Time Magazine hated it. And the only way you would hear about this is either through the radio or through Rolling Stone. And the music itself was this, this, what we call the tribal telegraph that connected uh, young people everywhere and spoke its language and to it and about things. And as, as it evolved, you could suddenly start listening in Dylan and the Beals and the Stones messages you know, about life, about how you treat people, about alienation, or about human justice or equal rights and all these things. And we were part of connecting the dots and reaching out. And we always said to ourselves that Rolling Stone was like a letter from home. And uh, I run across lots of people who come up to me and mention tonight as well, you know, how much it meant to them wherever they were growing up, listening to this stuff or feeling something. But who else was there around to talk about it? Who else was like me? I, Bruce Springsteen was the first person to mention this to me, really. In a, particularly, I said when he was 18 in Freehold, New Jersey, he would run to his, it was his uncle's radio repair shop where Rolling Stone would come in with a couple other magazines every two weeks. And he said it was like realizing that I was not out here in the world all alone. There was somebody else out there like me. Yeah. Well, shut up. Oh, that's beautiful, yeah. I, I, a lot of people have that story in uh, mine in that context is going to, of all places, the, the school library. We had a pretty hip librarian, I think, because um, we had a copy of Rolling Stone in the library. You couldn't take it out. You had to read it there, and there was a sheet where people signed up and kids were waiting to read it. And wow. we'd go down there and read it um, and look at the images. And this was uh, probably about 1977, um, 78, maybe eighth grade. And it was kind of a, a, a big thing for us and a connection. And who knows, maybe that's why I'm sitting here today. Um, so, uh, boy, I was going to go chronologically, but, uh, <coughs> y you know, I, I do think, Jan, we will talk about Rolling Stone a bit more. And I want to talk about the San Francisco years. And I want to talk about the New York years and sort of look at them in, in that context. But um, in reading your book, I was taken by, you've been a publisher since you know, you could hold a pencil in your hand as a, as a young, uh, young person growing up in Marin County on Rainbow Road um, in a pretty idyllic setting, but you put together a magazine even then. I, well, I, I was 10 years old, I had a neighborhood newspaper, <laughs> which cost a dime an issue, and it was called, this is a modest title, The Weekly Trumpet. And so we do neighborhood news and whose dog got run away. Or, and once we broke the story, I, this, I didn't know that such a thing was breaking stories, but just happened to report about, you know, from a friend of mine, his parents were talking about getting divorced. And we mentioned that in the, in the weekly trumpet. So and so and so are talking about getting a divorce. Dot, dot, dot. Well, <laughs> our circulation soared. <laughs> and, and they were paid issues, right? They were paid. Well, after about six months, you know, it was summer vacation. So me and my friends, Larry Doug, Larry Ashby, Doug Ashby, and Chris, what was her last, Dauphine, split up the $40, you know. <laughs> and we announced we were going to come back in the fall with a, a magazine called The Trumpeter, I think. But we didn't do that, and it was, then it was sixth grade time. And then I ended up being the editor of a, our junior high school newspaper called The San Venetia Informer, which went further in the gossip department. <laughs> Did, didn't one of them have a random note section? Oh, well, then I went to high school, and I, I ran for student body vice president. I was elected uh, because I made a ticket with a guy who was much more popular than me. And um, But one of the pledges was, in addition to the fact that we would get coffee privileges for seniors, we would – there was – what was the other – uh, coffee pills, I remember, and also we would publish a newspaper on campus for the students only. It's a campaign promise. It was a campaign promise. We were the progressive ticket. <laughs> and in a very deeply, deeply red area of Los Angeles. In fact, Palos Verdes is one of the homes of the John Birch Society, for those of you who remember this stuff. Um, anyway, so the theme of the school, this chat called Chadwick, is founded by a guy named and his wife named Commander Chadwick because he was a Naval Academy graduate. So the theme of school was nautical. So the yearbook was named the Dolphin, which I was also the editor of. The team was the Mariners. The, the, news, this, the official newspaper was called the Main Sheet. So I started a newspaper for the students, and we called it the Sardine. <laughs> well, the Sardine was ahead of its time. It had random notes, 
And it also had our slogan at the time, which was, all the news that fits. And I bought both of those into Rolling Stone. So you realize, you don't realize this stuff at the time you're starting, oh, I was meant to do this, or, you know, I mean, some angel smiled down, said, you shall make money doing this. Um, <laughs> but anyway, there it is. Yes, I've yeah. been a publisher all my life. Well, you always feel and like... I was born with... <laughs> <laughs> you feel like it's a zigzag path, but when you stand and look back, it all fits together. Um, so we've got you up through boarding school. Th then let's go to Berkeley. You're there. Um, near and dear to me because I also dropped out of college after two years uh, to open up a record store. Um, but you were in the thick of it in Berkeley, and you drop out in 1966? Six, I think I think 66, yeah. The, when I arrived at Berkeley in 1960, there was a, re, a real crucible of left-wing student politics, and I joined a group there right away called Slate, uh, which, had, which was the the campus radical group. And uh, the year before, two years before, he'd been responsible for demonstrating against the House Un-American Activities Committee, which was having hearings in San Francisco, and ran them out of town. But in any case, in 1964, that was the beginning of student protest and the series of events that led to formation of something called the free speech movement on campus, which is this big, kind of free-form student movement uh, advocating for free speech on a campus. It, did a couple of things. One is, there, in one of the earlier demonstrations, uh, they had about 3,000 students had surrounded a police car uh, in the middle of Sproul Plaza. And in the police car was a young man named Jack Weinberg, who they were trying to arrest for doing something or other. Jack Weinberg instantly turned out to be the guy who coined the phrase, don't trust anybody over 30. <laughs> I'm walking by, and it, all these you know, students are milling around. And then I see from on the steps of the administration building is Joan Baez, and she is singing uh, With God on Our Side, this Dylan song. And now vo Joan has the voice of an angel. I mean, it's, be it's incredibly beautiful and heavenly. And the lyrics of With God on Our Side are about hypocrisy, you know, about the need for peace, the waste of war, and how it keeps happening, you know. And finally at the end it says, even Judas Iscariot had God on his side. You know, when they crucified Jesus. And at that, mo that moment was the epiphany, in a way, for me of thinking that I'm, I've got to do something. You know, I've got to be, uh, this is a truth. You have to do something about it. You have to act on that truth. And that, that, that's what turned me around for me as kind of preppy, you know, kid from, from boarding school. Berkeley soon turned out to be at not only student politics and the beginning of it, in this country, not 1968 at Columbia University, but in 1964 and 65 in Berkeley, we were sending hundreds of students down the south to participate in Freedom Rides. The civil rights movement was tense there. The politics was intense. Uh, in addition to all that, it came drugs and came rock and roll, San Francisco scene. And it was in that crucible of those three elements that just all mixed together so many that you know, I found what I wanted to do. And, found the idea for Rolling Stone and this notion that I had to be a part of this somehow. Yeah. And since I couldn't play very well, Greg is better than me. I, you know what you do when you can't do it? You teach it. You tell people about it. Yeah. But, um, so you're out. And this is, to me, a really impressive and remarkable, actually, that you assemble this magazine you're immediately thinking about it being big. You know, you're not thinking about some little local piece. You're thinking about how do we do this bigger? And uh, it's gonna be about music and culture, uh, Rolling Stone. And then everybody is pretty well aware of some of these names and I wanna, I wanna read a few, then we're gonna ask you about some specifically. But you assemble this team that in those San Francisco years, even in the earliest years, it's Hunter, it's um, Ralph Gleason, of course, I should say him first. It's Baron Woolman, Tom Wolfe, Richard Avenden, uh, Esther House comes through in, in San Francisco, your blood brother, I believe, Ralph Steadman, Ken Kesey, Ben Fong Torres, John Landau from the start, um, Linda, who becomes Linda McCartney, and uh, many others. You know, we could keep rolling through them. But I do want to ask first about um, some people that, are, that we saw in our walk around the museum today. 
and that was going into the Baron Woolman exhibit on our first floor. There's a whole gallery of photos that uh, many of them on the wall were the earliest Rolling Stone cover shots. So Tina Turner, Jimi Hendrix, um, Janis Joplin, they're all there. And uh, Jan, you you gave Baron his sort of rock and roll start. Well, Baron Woolman, I met at some conference in San Francisco, and we kind of hit it off, and I told him I was thinking of starting the magazine and was looking for a photographer, and because I didn't want to use all these photographs of, of people on stage and when they're black background and they're talking in the mic and that's all you see the performer. And I just thought, to me, rock and roll is a lot, a lot about style and fashion and sexuality. And you had to show it. You had to show that in photography. And it had to be a a, a, a major component of what we were going to do. So Baron said he'll do it. And he became our first chief photographer, and I had no idea he was that good. He's turned out to be that good. He is, his background was, he had been working for the CIA in Berlin as a some special agent or something or other, and had freelance for something, and then he came back in trans with being a photographer, rather than a spy, and naturally, you go, ex-spies, come to me. Um, <laughs> we give him a halfway house, we bring him down, deprogram him. Anyway, uh, but that was a really lucky, Fine, and we just did lots of assignments together, uh, and lots of things together. And he was a, a, a you know, the love for years. Well, he was. Um, I know you stayed uh, close to him, Jan, for his entire life. And I, I do want to share with everybody here that um, just before COVID, uh, Jan sent an email uh, to me um, connecting me to Baron Woolman, so his earliest photographer for Rolling Stone. So this is my dear friend Baron. Um, he had um, been diagnosed with ALS and was looking for um, the right home for his collection. And a wonderful person, we, um, with Andy Leach, our, our library director, we got close to, close to Barron. Um, and we um, ultimately, from that introduction, uh, Barron entrusted his entire archive to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He donated all of it. Uh, it's 100,000 plus incredible images and gave us full rights forever. And uh, was just the sweetest about it. And it was a very magical homecoming, Jan, that you started. Barron grew up in Columbus, Ohio. Before going to Berlin and, you know, doing all these things and then uh, ending up in San Francisco. And he felt like uh, his collection was now going home uh, to Ohio and that we'd preserve it here forever. So thank you, Jan. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about another photographer. Then we'll get to the writers. Um, when we were in the Beatles exhibit downstairs, which is fantastic. If you haven't seen it, you have got to go in. It's the, um, the complement to the Peter Jackson docuseries. And um, um, Peter Jackson did all of the videos that you see downstairs, and our curatorial team put this together. That's just remarkable. But uh, sitting there by Paul McCartney is, is Linda uh, and taking photos during the uh, sessions. And Linda was a Rolling Stone employee Sent there. Well, Linda Eastman uh, was not exactly employed, but a, our, our, another photographer I had, besides, in addition to Barron, and she was in New York. Barron was in San Francisco. And she, the, and New York had access to a different kind of people. And in any case, she, she, she was the foundation of our library. And all of a sudden, she had asked me at some point, could she go to London on assignment and cover the Beatles, who were then making a White Album? And I said, well, why? I mean, we have enough Beatles. He says, well, I want to meet Paul. <laughs> I said, be my guest. <laughs> and then uh, from then for the next six months, I get postcards from her every week or so detailing how close she was getting in. She met him and finally and then she says, we had the most wonderful time. I owe it all to you, heart Linda. So you knew this was happening. But anyway, that's just a curious piece of, of rock history. And we stayed friends forever. And... Uh, and it was a sad moment when she died of cancer earlier. But it's an interesting yeah. thing to be that kind of a Cupid. I, you know, uh, well, I, Greg I, gives me more credit. I, I, there are fascinating stories because it's sort of like the Baron Woolman thing, and you're modest about it, Jan, but um, uh, you've connected so many people, not just people that you've never met that have read Rolling Stone, um, but people that you're around. And we'll get to that a little bit, this idea of creating community. Um, and community can be 
everybody, all the readers that feel a kinship, but it's also the, the team you put together to work on these projects and, um, and just how everybody relates to each other. And with that, I think we must ask this question because a, a, one of our guests gave it to us earlier as well. And um, everybody wants to know about, about Hunter S. Thompson, everybody. And um, I'm gonna start by giving you a quote that was in the book where you're asking Hunter to file a story and he says, uh, and a reply back, you know, that he wants to do it, but he says, let me know what you pay. I'll write the fucker anyway, but I tend to bear down a little more when I smell money. <laughs> so, well, how do you manage a guy like that? Well, Hunter was a lot of, Hunter was this, was this enormous talent, and this enormously charming, funny, warm, gentlemanly guy from Louisville, Kentucky. And for all the reputation of him being crazy and reckless and on and on, he was never reckless or crazy. You know, he was a very calculated guy who knew what he was doing. You could safely put your life in, the hand, in his hands, as I did many times, and come out alive. And everybody who met him found in him this really charismatic guy that if you hung out with, you'd enjoy yourself not only enormously just love the laughter, but also you could at some points feel you were going to come as close to the edge of the cliff as you're ever going to come in your life and get that excitement. But, you know, handling Hunter required tolerance, you know, understanding his humor. More than understanding, I had to share, it was a sharing of the humor. We had the same sense of humor. We had the same... <laughs> love of insulting people, of blowing up fireworks at, late at night after they've gone to sleep in front of their houses and stealing shit off of restaurant signs and stuff. I mean, so we had a lot in common. But um, he, he became a great, one of my best friends ever. And we, I think, saw in each other too that, the, that he was, I was his ideal editor and had the ideal publication, with, which we give him space and freedom, and that I understood him better as a writer than anybody else. I knew how to deal with him and his copy, and that I loved him. And uh, I understood that what, that I had stumbled across, by sheer luck, uh, this, this great original. And with a point of view and a mission and desire to get certain things done in writing this country and, uh, that we share. And we had a similar, we had the same purpose and this, we shared the same mission. And um, we wanted to be partners with each other in Rolling Stone. Not in a formal way. I, I said no to that because I said, Hunter, I'll come home one day and I'll find out you've bought the you know, Cadillac dealership in Arizona or something and it'll just be terrible. And, uh, but, he, we sort of, he looked after the magazine and with ideas and patience and coming there and being a guiding spirit to everybody. And I looked after him and protecting him and his interests. And uh, we set about, do we want to change the kind of dialogue in the country and to change out the attitudes of young people towards politics? He used to say, oh, young people, they, they don't know the difference between Kent State and Kent cigarettes. <laughs> and, uh, and I think we succeeded at that. Well, it was a moment, I think, too, when you bring folks like that on board and you went from music and culture, you had politics, you had, you know, uh, climate, you had social issues like the, the war on drugs uh, and things like that. It, it broadens the scope of the magazine. Um, well, we always said from the beginning we were going to cover the things that music was talking about and was about and were the change that reflected music. Uh, and we did pretty much from the start, but, and we had won... Uh, a national magazine more for our Charlie Manson expose. Uh, it was at a time when people weren't sure he was guilty or not guilty. And we, we conclusively showed that he was guilty and said so. But it was putting Hunter on the campaign trail. And we'd had some big national news breaks before that. But it was putting Hunter on the campaign trail that really changed things for Rolling Stone because we put our best writer, an unusual gifted writer, a dazzling individual 
on the biggest story there is at this in this country every four years, and that is the presidential campaign. So you had a really high-profile event, which we were regularly covering, turning out amazing work, got the attention of everybody else on the press corps, and which brought us kind of national attention and national recognition. And once Hunter was done with that, we decided we would cover politics as a regular beat from then on out, and we always had a White House or a national correspondent, uh, and had up until my last days at Rolling Stone. Hunter, Dick Goodwin, Matt Taibbi, Bill Greider, you know, a really distinguished roster of terrific writers on politics. So, um, talking about Hunter and serial, sort of serializing people like Tom Wolfe, uh, more investigative work, I think you guys broke the Karen Silkwood we, story. We, at a time, well, Tom Wolfe just... For Tom, Tom was a great writer. In it, he was already established writer when I, I, and I he had done electric Kool Aid acid tests by that time, and I just wanted him in Rolling Stone. So I just, at age 24, 25, set up about finding him and romancing him and trying to get him to the pages of Rolling Stone. And we tried an assignment about the records that didn't work, and finally said, "Why don't you go do the last launch of the Apollo?" And out of that came the series, The Right Stuff, about the astronauts became huge work of his. Working with him was the absolute opposite of working with Hunter. Tom was responsible, reliable, <laughs> polite, didn't need a lot, he wasn't good on deadlines, but he didn't need a lot of crazy editing, and, uh, uh, but a southern gentleman, nonetheless. But he fit, like Hunter fit, in this mix of people that wanted to cover America, you know? the oddities of America, the fringe life of America, that idea of the mainstream of America, what America was about, what it stood for, what it was becoming, uh, the way it operated. It, that always shared in common. But in terms of going to more investigation, we hired uh, three terrific writers out of daily newspapers, terrific reporters, David Felton, the LA Times, Howard Cohn from the Detroit Free Press, and Joe Esterhouse from the Cleveland Plain Dealer. And it was with this core of reporters that we sort of, with Tom and Hunter and Annie on the side here, and a couple of college kids we picked up in San Francisco, a championship swimmer from Waukesha, Wisconsin, who was a great fiction writer, and a science major from Stanford uh, University who knew all about you know, the beginning of science down there and the internet and stuff like that, uh, and put together this fa fantastic reporting team and staff for about five years that ran in San Francisco. And uh, Esther House was one of the key leaders of it. You know, he'd been fired from the plane dealer. And uh, we were, where did we go? Ex-spies, ex-reporters? <laughs> go to Rolling Stone. He, he went to the end of the country Stone. and couldn't go any further. Yeah. And you grabbed him. We rehab your people, yes. <laughs> so, so um, you know, let's, let's move that over to New York. You, you, actually, before we do, we should talk a little bit about um, one of your earliest writers, that also has a huge shadow at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He was inducted recently, um, John Landau. John Landau, who is now most known for being Bruce Springsteen's manager, um, was a, a contributor from issue one in San Francisco and uh, has been ever since. And after about 10 years, he told me he's going to quit and uh, go to work for Bruce. He had met this guy, Bruce Springsteen. He liked a lot and he thought this was me the biggest thing coming up in, rolling, in rock and roll. But, you know, John was one of the, the kind of intellectual thought leader, kind of the senior, even though he was my age, he was younger than me, he, he established himself with the, most, uh, the senior, most respectable, widely followed critics of rock and roll in the United States because he was one of the few who actually was a musician and could write about music. And some of the, some reviewers didn't know that much about it, and there's this kind of new field of rock criticism was starting. They they were clever writers, but they didn't know this stuff. So people like who've got big reputations, like Lester Banks, would take a record and like rip it apart just because they thought it was a fun riff. And they would review the clothes the artist was wearing or the rat jacket, record jacket, but never the uh, cover. I mean, never the music itself. I thought there's a real injustice to our readers who were counting us to tell them what's a good record to listen to, buy or not buy, to the artists who deserved serious attention and, and, and critical attention to their work, which they had spent so much time on, 
as part of the natural artist critical, you know, circle cycle that informs and builds art and makes people think. And a disservice to the record companies who are supporting us by shitting on their records. So anyway, I fired all those people and brought Landau in to run the whole section and give it a kind of gravitas, which it soon got, and seriousness. And it, you know, John built the critical reputation of Rolling Stone and was one of my was a great influencer to me. And he was a man who really turned me on to R and B and to Stax Volt and Wilson Pickett and all the great stuff, which still is my favorite music to this time. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. just FYI, Bruce has got a new record coming out next week or the week after, a couple of weeks, of covers of R&B songs of the 70s, which is so good, this record. I mean, I, those of you who are East Street fans and Bruce fans, they're great. This, this is a record where his voice is better than ever, and he's got the best songs ever he's singing, and they're written for singers, and they're true to the original arrangements, and it, it, it just knock your socks off. And I've had the privilege of pleasure of having it for the last several months as my private record that I get to listen to all the time. <laughs> and so I saw on Instagram today, he announced the release of it. And I, well, that's great, but I had a little sight. Oh, my, my little private treasure. That's not my, <laughs> the I, secret I have is to out. share that now. But get it. Super. It's called so, Only the Strong Survive. I can, he I can hear that. I can hear I him can doing that for sure. Right now. <laughs> so, um, so you're in New York, and you've I have to say, you talked about you know shuffling, you know some of the staff with their, their record reviews, but you're also expanding in the '70s. And I'm going to get this a little out of order, but I think the the gist of it is, you know, you go from Rolling Stone to Winter Media. You pull in Outside, Us Magazine, Men's Journal, Family Life, um, and uh, you had Straight Arrow Press. You're doing publications, and I'm I, I wanted talk about these, but also you go from being an editor of this piece that's near and dear to running all these things. And, you know, we talked about the talent in San Francisco. You've got to reload again in New York. You also need to stack all these places. How do you find all these people? And how did you, how'd you pull this together? Well, <clears throat> you know, it's luck and serendipity. And I really think a lot of it is good karma and good timing. I mean, timing, my timing couldn't have been better for all these things as to when it started, when to move to New York, where I was in Berkeley in 1964, what was happening, and all, all kinds of things throughout my life where I find myself <clears throat> like Zelig or like uh, uh, Tom Hanks' character, what was his, Forrest, Forrest Gump. Gump, being in some place, which is, but I, I th so this timing, I think a lot of it has to do with just good karma and the reason I was there. I mean, I, I was never doing any of these things for prof, you know, for profit or to make a pundle or, I really wasn't that ambitious, you said, to have the biggest magazine in the world. You know, I was just doing it because I love rock and roll. So I think the good purposes got repaid in some karmic way, you know, then and now. Bang, light of blue, boldly, I'm dead. Um, <laughs> only and, the strong uh, survive. <laughs> only the strong survive. Um, and um, I think also Rolling Stone by this time had become so good that it attracted people, that anybody else good out there their dream was to come to Rolling Stone or work for Rolling Stone or write for Rolling Stone. So over the transom came an enormous amount of talent. And again, I say that's karma because we had been doing such good work, you know, in San Francisco in our warehouse or whatever, that it brought all sorts of people along. And it made that then easy to do. But in moving to New York, after having this big string of journalistic hits and successes in San Francisco, Hunter and Tom Wolfe and the Patty Hearst kidnapping, the Silkwood case, the John Lennon interview, just one after the other after the other. When we got to New York, that my crew of writers that I had edited and hands-on run as my team <clears throat> started to disperse. I got very involved in the business side of the magazine and need to build it up and secure it, you know, and get solid set up as an ongoing institution and all the demands of New York. and. The reason we moved to New York was to do that, that I turned the editorial reins over to other people to let them, them be the editors of it under my supervision. And uh, I started thinking of myself more as a publisher as well as an editor and started concentrating more on that and thinking, well, we should publish other magazines. We've got this infrastructure going with all these people. So we started, the first one we did there was Outside and which still lives today, is still a very credible magazine which I had to sell uh, and because uh, it ran out of money. And uh, another magazine, and 
you know, it was great. You know, so I was a magazine publisher. But the, and then the, then Rolling Stone stuff entered into a different period where culture was different, where we covered more entertainment, and movies, you know, and stuff like that, and less investigative journals. And we had different competition all of a sudden. All of a sudden, we're competing with 60 Minutes and the New York Times for great stories, where before they used to ignore all the stuff we covered. Anyway, long answer. Yeah, it, it's fascinating. And the other piece of this that was a, enlightening to me, you know, I knew that you had some, you had a walk, you had walk on parts in some films, especially as yourself. But you also did some acting uh, in Jerry Maguire and Crime Story, and you know, you've got an IMBD byline with a whole bunch of credits as an actor. <laughs> I did a, I was in Cameron's movie Almost Famous, which all of you know and we all love. I could, he had offered me a part, but I couldn't because it was a way. But he put me in his little tiny cameo where I'm in a taxi cab and a hero of it running around looking for a cab to get into. And he stumbles in my cab and I give him a dirty look and go back to my paper. Now. And, but I got a credit in the, in the end credits and, and my part was legend in a taxi cab. <laughs> so Cameron decided, I don't know, did Almost Famous come out after Jerry Maguire? Well, maybe it was Jerry Maguire. Anyway. Well, I forget which came first. Jerry Maguire was first. So he had cast me an actual part where I had speaking lines in Jerry Maguire where I was Tom Cruise's boss in the opening scenes and, <clears throat> you know, basically involved me glaring at Tom Cruise and looking at him over a balcony thinking, you're crazy. And I communicated that apparently very well. I rehearsed it with Tom before the thing and we started. And so I started throwing these like motherfuckers and fuckers. <laughs> You know, which weren't in a script, but made me tougher. We, we get on the set and we're filming. And I start off and Tom is mainly throwing motherfuckers back at me before I can start my first motherfucker. <laughs> you, you can't outshine Tom Cruise. <laughs> and and don't, don't try. So because of that and, and the fact that Jerry Maguire is such a big hit, he wanted me in as a good luck charm to be in his next movie, almost famous. And then finally, he... he he put me in Vanilla Sky. It was a briefer, even briefer part. Didn't do as well. And after that, everything was tanked. So, <laughs> back to publishing. But, back, but Cameron is a dear friend and is almost famous opening on Broadway next month. And he continued to write articles for Rolling Stone over the years. And you know, we're always in contact. He's a great guy. Fantastic. That was a side of you I didn't fully uh, appreciate till I read the book. So really fascinating. Um, you know, we... You, we talked a little bit about Landau. Landau, I think, let's talk about the Hall of Fame a little more before we go back to, to New York. But the Hall of Fame, you know, you were the chairman for two decades. Uh, you went to many ceremonies. In, in fact, to connect some real dots here, um, our, very, our first curator was a former Rolling Stone writer and editor, Jim Hinkey, right? Yeah. And... Um, a Clevelander that came home. He was he was the copy editor of the Cleveland Plain Dealer. Uh, I don't know how we heard about him, but we hired him to come to New York in the eighties, I think, uh, and became our music editor. Where he met, wooed, and took away from us Eliza Wing, who was another editor working there. Jim's Jim, I mean Eliza and her two sons are here tonight, wherever they are. <laughs> Along with another great editor of ours in the past, Susan Marco, and her husband, they're from Ohio. And I'm going to go home. Bye. <laughs> no. Good place um, to find editors. So, uh, Jim, um, when we started to do the, when we, the whole thing, time to really do the Hall of Fame, um, I asked Jim if he would become the curator of it and be able to go back, go back to Cleveland. And Jim was happy to return to Cleveland and happy to move on from being a music editor at Rolling Stone after so many years to take over the Hall of Fame. And he and I built the initial collections here and got all the initial stuff in. So, so uh, wonderful connection. Um, and so what I want to continue with the Hall of Fame, and that's two decades of ceremonies that you've, well, two decades More as that. chair, probably 33 different ceremonies out of 36 years maybe, or 34 ceremonies out of, you only missed. I missed a couple, but I stopped producing it after the 20, well, I was, did the couple after the 25th, and then I stopped producing yeah. those. I'm not going to ask over. your favorite, because that might be hard, but a, a couple memories in, 
you know, we sat in the Power of Rock Theater. If you haven't been in it before, it's this incredible uh, show on our third floor. Um, per, the edit is all done by Jonathan Demi. It was his final um, uh, piece that he edited. And uh, it's all moments from induction ceremonies and the 25th anniversary concerts and others. And it ends with, with Prince playing that guitar solo. I have a feeling that has to be one of your moments. That's one of the great moments. I mean, I've been so many, especially in the beginning before really it was being filmed or televised or anything. And it was kind of a smaller and informal dinner affair instead of this big concert we turned it into. And old artists who hadn't seen each other in years. I mean, the first year we had Chuck Berry, Jerry Lee Lewis, Fats Domino, Little Richard, Ray Charles, Elvis is dead. I think Buddy Holly's, Holly's widow. All together on the stage, these people hadn't seen each other in years. But also the music was, these are guys are kind of old men at this point, and they come into Waldorf Astoria for this for the first dinner, and there's this black tie crowd, you know, all sitting everywhere, and their photos are in black and white up on the Waldorf balconies here and there, and they're being honored, you know, for what had been a life of crime or, or something. That <laughs> had, I mean, had been, you know, never thought of serious as, as serious artists and never been treated that well, although some came much later. Success came along, but, I mean, these are the people who did it, who invented it as teenagers or 20 years old and who had been run out of places. They were the creators. They, that was the Big Bang. Well, they, to see them all together is magic. In later years, the collaboration started, and you'd see things like Mick and Bob Dylan and Bruce singing like a Rolling Stone together or... You know, Bruce and Axl Rose singing come together it was great. I mean, just tons of tons of great moments. And really, and in those early days, it was great because of those collaborations. Because everybody being inducted then were all solo artists. They weren't bands then. When we started doing bands, you know, and the bands then wanted to play together without a the Paul Schaefer group backing them up, it changes its tenor. It becomes more professional and more rehearsed. And I introduced the idea of television cameras and putting on MTV because I thought against everybody else's better wishes that th what was happening was so special and so magic and so extraordinary thing to watch all these artists work together. You never saw it in any other place, never saw that intimately, that it was, it was criminal to, to keep it private, that this should be shared with everybody. I mean, there are more music love in the country than just us in that room and they couldn't see this. So we went, anyway, which were the best dinners? I, I don't know. My favorite thing to do was the uh, 25th anniversary uh, two-night concert at Madison Square Garden. I think one of the best concerts I've ever seen in my life. Uh, the, not only with the artists, in, incredible selection, two nights of them, collaborations were brilliant. What you had seen on the stage, you could never see anywhere before. I mean, you, you had Bruce and Bono and Mick all collaborating. At the peak of it, when I... But the, the U2 set was being done, and at the and Bruce had walked out and they had sung a couple of songs together, and then they all of a sudden you heard that familiar vamp from the beginning of of uh, Gimme Shelter, and then Mick walks out on the stage. He was unannounced. The garden went in fucking nuts, <laughs> but it's, it was very special because all these artists were playing in front of their peers and other artists. Everybody's there watching or from backstage or sitting in the audience watching. And so everybody performed at their really highest level, you know, to, for this moment, for this occasion, for the benefit of the Hall of Fame and for in the, in the presence of their other artists. And so that was, that was what was magic. But I did about 30 years of those shows, and they, we started the Hall of Fame, geez, 40 years before that, you know, 10 years before that. So yeah. it's been a run. A lot, of, <laughs> a lot of late nights, but the, the 25th, I'm with you. I was lucky enough to be there. Well, I'd say one thing. I Every time I felt, I, this is so special. I'm at such a special moment, such a special occasion to see this stuff. I would regularly walk out with tears in my eyes. And what a privilege to see this. And what a privilege it was to work with all those artists on stage and producing those shows and minor little things and you make suggestions or whatever and put combinations together. But it was a thrill, a, a highest honor to work with all that talent for so long. Anyway. Well, that leads to um, uh, community, I think. is a, and When we walked around, we talked a lot about that. And uh, the community, of course, of Rolling Stone readers, but the community that you've put together through music. You know, you've got travel partners that you 
um, you vacation with, you have families that are, that are blended, great families. And in, in, um, in New York, I, I didn't realize that you're, you're close to, you know, Jackie O and Carolyn and, and John, very close. And, um, Bono is a neighbor and you see Bruce and Patty and all of this sort of connection, um, it is pretty remarkable. And it's, it's about community. Uh, I could read a bunch more names here, but, um, I think that pulling people together is something that the that music has done and that your magazine has done, but also that you, you do in all aspects of your life. Well, I mean... I mean, music is this great bonding thing. I mean, you instantly know you've got a friend. If you can say, oh, you talk about a concert or I like that record or something, and you, and, oh, that person must... There must be something good about that person, because initially, because they like the Stones. They, obviously, you can't be all bad. And and the more intense the music, or the more personal, more emotional, the more deep those connections are. And as you explore those, and it just becomes richer. And it's it's the kind of thing that it. When I spoke here at the ribbon cutting opening, I said something effective. This music calls out around the world. And it's this music that's giving you such joy, that's lifted you up at times of heartbreak, this sustained hope. And it's the language of everybody in the world who wants to be it. So I believe that's the message of this museum. But in any case, so like Bruce, for example, first of all, I know a lot of musicians because that's the business I end. I enjoy them. I enjoy artistic people, you know. But you, you, start to, you, you start to bond around music. And, you know, you start to bond around, oh, God, I love this guy's music. It's fantastic. And then he likes you liking it, you know? And then pretty soon, you, you know, if you spend much time, you start becoming friends. And it's, it's, all, it's through the music that you, all, you got connected. And this, the music is still so central to the, even so central to the relationship. I mean, even you become, you know, family friends and it's all about that and your kids and so on. Like, still, that music is so central. And, People like like Mick. One of the ways you can really people have a hard time relating to him, you know, because he's kind of stiff and cold and standoffish and nice guy, but you know, protecting himself. But if you start start talking music with Mick, he just becomes alive because fundamentally he's a musician and he likes music, you know, and he loves talking about it. He loves doing it. And loves playing. It. I don't know where the question was and all that, but <laughs> somewhere there's an answer. We, we left it open enough to just go. And uh, no, it's, you're right. When we walk through the museum with, with artists frequently, they don't necessarily want to see their own stuff. They want to see the people that they admired and that shaped them um, and that they um, really, at important times in their lives, are, are people that they, they admire. Um, I mean, you got to say, look, I gave you that raggedy outfit because I didn't want it. So what the fuck are you showing it to me again for? <laughs> I, I, I used mean, to fit in what? <laughs> yeah. But I re one of the treasures here, I think, always was one of the very first things we got was we hooked up, uh, I think it was Jim, hooked up with uh, Jim Morrison's mother. And she gave us all of the stuff she had. And she had Jim Morrison's Cub Scout uniform, which I hope is still on display. Uh, we still have it. I, I mean, think about that. The Lizard King was once you know, a Boy Scout. <laughs> We also had, I believe it was Brian Wilson's Little League. Oh, my God, I didn't know about that. Yeah, little wow. flannel, sleeveless thing. <laughs> and uh, it, it sort of underscores that a lot of these artists um, and, and fans have sort of shared experiences, and it might make it even stronger because of that. Um, I, I do, um, we've talked about a, a lot of, you know, a lot of famous people and a lot of, um, you know, amazing musicians, writers, others. Um, you've also had a special relationship, and um, you've sort of reserved the presidential interview. Uh, you didn't send somebody else to do those. You did them, and uh, you've interviewed a few presidents. Um, I'm, I'm curious, because it's a nice synthesis, Jan, of your early, um, you talk about rock and you talk about Rolling Stone being founded in the crucible of, of Berkeley um, it, with an incredible backdrop of, of politics. Uh, you covered it through the years. You're advocating for important causes. And then you are sitting down with presidents that um, I believe support a lot of the same things. Um, and it's it's your time just with them. Uh, what, are, what are they like? And can you tell us more? 
Well, I never dreamed that when we started that we'd be you know, at the White House or covering that stuff, or it was. Or I didn't even think it was really within our purview. I mean, the kind of politics we were covering, our kind of local radical student, you know, a lot to do with civil rights stuff and anti-Vietnam stuff. But when Hunter was on the 1972 campaign trail with McGovern, Hunter, his work gave us access to the campaign at the, uh, all levels up to George and um, gave us importance to the campaign that they felt they were reading more stuff about the campaign's value more important to them in Rolling Stone than they were reading anywhere else. And it was also the year that 18-year-olds uh, were enfranchised to vote. So it was the first time that the youth vote could potentially be really meaningful. And of course, there's a war going on. So it was a very fraught election, but that brought us to that level of involvement, of kind of intense involvement, presidential politics, and actually being in it. So from there, as I said before, we never quite backed away from it. You know, now, uh, we, we gave George our, you know, full backing, and Dorsen put on the cover, you know, did everything we can, of course. <laughs> and uh, uh, so we got involved again uh, in the presidential pauses when Carter ran, ran after Nixon, then Ford, then Ford into Regnum. Uh, and, you know, Hunter Earl was early on with Carter, and Carter took a huge liking to, to Jimmy, and Jimmy thought Hunter was fantastic, you know. And Jimmy, Jimmy was a real intellectual. And what I call him, there was a documentary that we call the first rock and roll president. I mean, he was sponsored by, he was sponsored with money that came, that was raised by the Allman Brothers in concerts. He knew Dylan. He liked Dylan. Dylan liked him. I mean, he was a, a very special guy. I never interviewed him. Hunter spent a lot of time. I got involved in interviewing presidents with uh, Clinton. I never cared to interview a Republican president or candidate. I just, you know, they're going to lie to you, so what's the point? <laughs> you know, I mean, I mean, think about who they were, too. Um, <clears throat> I mean, really, among the worst presidents we've ever had in the history of the United States. I won't name names, but, and it's beyond the, that one. Um, the, um, but interviewing is a really interesting experience. So I interviewed Clinton, uh, Al Gore, John Kerry, Obama, I think those four principally, and uh, yeah, those four, and then I stopped. Um, they're difficult to interview in one way because every politician who's running for office is very carefully rehearsed. They, everything they're going to say has been pre-tested, pre-looked at. It's been, you know, vetted by the campaign staff because we're in an era where you just say one candid thing or one remark, and they can, the other side can just torture you to death with it and whip up the press, and all of a sudden you're. In, in a scandal which may not cost, any, cost you anything along, but it takes up the air for a week and a half, you know? So everything is pre-tested. And uh, you can't get the mouth message, but, you know, so I never try and ask the gotcha questions or the question of the moment about when will you pull the troops out or something. What, what's the, they're not gonna answer the question anyway. There is no answer to the question. But I try and find out what they're like, what music they like, what they, how they make decisions, uh, you know, stuff to draw out the personality, you know, to get the way they think. And, and that gets to be really interesting. And I think you get to know the candidate really well. And I think that all these guys that I interviewed all present themselves really well in these long form, because you don't see long form interviews except Rolling Stone on the presidential candidates. They don't give the time to it. And the mass of reporters are interested in getting that topical question of the day. I've enjoyed it enormously. I mean, had great experience of fun with Bill and seeing him blow his top several times is quite something. And um, he also a great talker nonstop and talks and has kind of got this southern way of talking. He's always talking about like, oh, he, he told the NATO allies this and there was madder than a chicken in a hen house, you know? And <laughs> what, the NATO allies are madder than a split chicken and a fox? What are you talking about, you cracker? You know? And, uh, Al uh, is great. Al uh, has got to be the smartest. Bill's got to know everything. Al's got to be the smartest person in the room. And then they go on and on about the prime minister of Tanganyika, who they've known from college, and his, his name is Akalodana Vazand. And, it, I mean, enough. You know, you want to say, okay, Al, you've proved 
how smart you are. You know every foreign minister in Africa, but now let's talk about this other stuff. And, uh, uh, and Obama is just amazing. I mean, he is a precise, careful speaker who talks in, in whole sentences, or excuse me, paragraphs that may start even to wander off, but he always brings them back with all his conjunctive things, and he's very careful about what he wants to say and what he doesn't say. My, the classic with him was, and, I'm, and I'll stop this conversation, but we, with all the presidents, I've done the exit interview, which is there with Clinton and with Obama, and where you're going to sum up their years in office and what they've learned. And I had the ex exit interview scheduled with Obama, and the young gets to, they give them to two magazines. Uh, and the interview is scheduled for the day after the election. Bring yourself back in ancient time. Uh, Obama's president. Hillary's going to be our next president. All right, so the ni that night... The, the returns come in. The returns come in, and I mean, so talk about depressing. It's like the bomb had dropped. I mean, it was like, my God, there's going to be d destruction. Where are we going to hide? What's going to... How do we put this back together? What so I called the White House first thing in the morning. I was obviously hungover. I said, look... <laughs> I said, you, I mean, uh, ask the president. I'm happy to postpone this to another day. And they call back two minutes. No, the president wants to do it. Come on down with Let's do it now. So I go down to Washington with Gus, my son, who's getting prepared to take over Rolling Stone. And we, it's a gray day. You know, it's cloudy. The streets are deserted in Washington, D.C. What is it, a Wednesday or something like that? And it's eerily quiet and spooky. The whole thing is spooky. The day is spooky. We get to the White House. The White House is usually bus busting. Virtually nobody is there. You know, you walk in the West Wing entrance, the East Wing, whatever entrances. There's usually guards, people sitting in the reception on empty, you know, except for one guard. Nobody's there. It is cleared out. Obviously, no. Everybody else is drunk too. They've been up all <laughs> night. So, I have just had been scrambling. Thinking, if he wants to go to the interview, I have to the, come up with a whole new set of questions. I mean, I've been there saying, you know, what, what did you learn? And how does it feel turning the country over to Hillary? And what's your advice for Hillary? And, you know, just the parting, the valedictory lap, you know. Well, I, we walk in the Oval Office. There's, there's Barack, his coat, tie, you know, dressed up. I'm not in a tie. He says, and Gus, my son, is in a tie. Later, he says, how do, you, how do you get away with that? You know, like he's insulted or something. But anyway, so we sit down, and I start to ask him, the questions, and it's really coming down to, I don't want to upset him, and there's no point asking him about Trump too much because, I mean, what can he say? The, it, it, you know, the tradition is you don't comment on your predecessor at, at all, and also he's there to reassure, as the president, he's there to reassure us, uh, the, the citizens of the United States and our allies and the world that it'll be all right, despite the fact this obvious madman, this idiot, this moron, this vain, this, un don't even start, okay, it's gonna be, so, I, he says, I said, so, what, 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 I mean, what do you think, I mean, our chancellor, he goes, well, you know, this office transforms you sometimes, and you sit down at the desk, and you look over there, and it's this portrait of George Washington, and it makes you a different person, I said, well, Mr. President, I mean, how, what gives you the idea that he's gonna be a different person, he's 75 years old, he's not gonna change now, he's gonna be the same. And he says, because, you know, Jan, if you want to get down on the floor in a ball and curl yourself in a ball and start to cry, we can do that. <laughs> you know, but I don't think that's helpful. I mean, this is an election. It's not a tragedy. My mother dying of cancer two weeks ago is a tragedy. Get up, fight, you know, and get back to work. And I thought, well, you know, he was right. That's, that's, that's all you can do in his job. And... You know, we've spent four years now bitching, complaining about Trump and all this kind of stuff. But, you know, it was, it's fun to bitch, complain. But, you know, we're all saying the same thing. It's the issue is get up and fight, you know, or get up and do something or run for something. Run for a school board. Run for anything. You know, do, do something. You know, it's up to us. So I thought his message was thing. But anyway, it's a kind of a historic moment, you know, to catch him in this, you know, thing. So, yeah, powerful. Well, Jan, um, we're, we're rounding home here. And I think no, we're not. I got a lot. Of you want to keep going? <laughs> Wait, I, I think there's a lot of books to be signed as well in this crowd, right? Oh, uh, I'm not sticking around for that. Oh no, right. I I can do a pretty good John Winter. 
<laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I just, you think about going from, you know, Rainbow Road and the, um, the Daily Trumpet? Weekly. Weekly Trumpet, not a daily. The Weekly Trumpet <laughs> to the White House to being in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, to having created this place, established this place. And um, I, I kind of want to roll us home by saying that you've given the world, you know, a life-changing publication for many people, um, gave them a place to belong. You gave a Rock and Roll Hall of Fame uh, a place to celebrate and honor those that you love, but also that we all love. And it gives all of us a, a place to be inspired this Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And on behalf of those 350-something-odd inductees and the 14 million fans that have visited this place, um, I think the best way to close is just to say thank you. At the risk of being anticlimactic, I want to say thank you. It's, it is like coming home, and uh, it is like seeing family and being with people who share the same thing we all share that we all love. And I th want to thank Greg for doing really a spectacular job with us, taking it beyond. <laughs> it's, it's beyond what I imagined, and it's... The different is at the core of the same, but so feeling so different, so vibrant now, and I really think Greg, Greg deserves a lot of credit. And um, you know, I'm happy to be here. I've had a lucky life, and I just say one thing. At the beginning of the book, the first, the little epigraph at the front where you can quote your songs, one, the two quote things. The first quote I put there is, "Hail, hail, rock and roll, deliver me from the days of old." So yeah, Chuck Berry, you. first rock and roll Hall of Fame inductee. Well, Jan, I appreciate that, and I want to thank the Rock Hall staff, the whole team here. Everybody loves this place and kills it. Our donors, our supporters, our board members, and everybody else. Um, thank you all, and one more time, let's hear it for Jan Winter.